Welcome to the Running For Real podcast, where each week we bring you a conversation designed to help you create positive change in your life, community and planet. It's a collective of conversations about running, the climate emergency and social justice. Running For Real is for the brave, for those with courage and vulnerability. United by our love of running, we're driving momentum towards some of the really tough challenges we're facing as humanity. So come join me, Tina Muir, and let's get started. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 243 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited to bring back a guest who has been on the show three times, one of very few who has been on that many. Um, And I'm looking forward to sharing this conversation with you. First, did you go check out the Running Realized episode that came out uh, Monday. Yeah, it would have been a few days ago now. Um, We were really excited to release episode four of the show. We have worked really, really hard on this episode and it was a tough one. Um, It was one that both Knox and I felt pretty, um, it was very new to us. We did a lot of learning, a lot of listening. Um, We were focusing on Um, gender binary and trans runners. It is obviously a hot button topic in the running space and in the world right now. And I hope you enjoyed that episode. It made you think if you have not listened to that episode, I really would recommend going back and giving it a listen, even if this is something that you think you've already made your mind up about. Um, I felt we did. I was really proud of us for how we did with this. And if you haven't already listened, you can go find Running Realized on any of your favorite uh, podcast platforms. Now, today I am excited to bring back my friend Dean Karnazes, who is back for a third time. He um, is known as Ultra Marathon Man and has done all these crazy feats. I'm not going to go over them again. You can listen to the first two episodes with Dean if you like. And actually, episode one with Dean, it wasn't episode one, but the first episode we did with Dean, which there will be a link in the show notes to both of those. Were, uh, was one of Amber's, uh, my uh, community manager, her favorite episodes. It was one of her top five episodes that she mentioned when I had her on the show a few months ago. It was a really good one. And today I really challenged Dean. I dug in and asked him some really tough questions, um, some things that uh, were really challenging his identity, some things he's been going through the past year. And I think it will be a really insightful one for you to get to know a different side of him. Um, he has commented that I managed to crack through and get to um, some difficult topics that he doesn't cover anywhere else. And I think I did that again today. So once we hear from one of our sponsors, we will get right to the episode with Dean Karnazes. Thank you to Momentus for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I am really thankful to be working with this company and I keep teasing to you, but I still can't say anything just yet. But there is some really exciting changes that they are making to um, really make a big uh, reduction in the carbon footprint. I can't really say much more than that at this point, but I feel really, really good about the direction the company is going in. Um, and I just feel like they care. So um, I'm excited to yeah, share more about that sometime soon. Now, I've mentioned each of the products that I use uh, through this podcast, and I am actually testing out one of the new ones, which is Brain Drive, um, which is to kind of optimize your uh, thinking <laughs> as, I, as I struggle to think, optimize your focus. And it's something that I just want to make sure that I give some time before I speak out about. But so far, I've really been enjoying it and finding it very helpful when I have my little bursts of time where I can do work in the mornings. And so that is, that's been something really helpful. Um, I have mentioned before, and I'll mention it again, um, I have really been enjoying the Elite Sleep. Um, I have had a few uh, nights where I could tell I was um, uh, flustered and unable to sleep and when I have taken that before bed I have found it to really help me to settle my mind and to um, drift off to sleep even when there is a lot of my on my mind and I've never really found that before especially when I've j- tried to just use um, melatonin on my own so I definitely am enjoying the momentous elite sleep and also um, I have been really trying out the the creatine lately not all the time I'm not trying to 
bulk myself up but um, it's just been an enjoyable thing that I can use and if you are an older athlete that is something that's really going to help your body um, with some of the uh, things that occur with aging that is by taking um, additional creatine it's going to help your body to um, uh, balance out the changes that your body is going to be going through through losing that um, muscle mass that's going to happen over time so you can get 20% off your order at livemomentous.com that's livemomentous.com by using code tina you can get 20% off your order go check them out they've got lots of other products on there you can go check out and um, yeah thank you so much to momentous hey that's better <laughs> there you go so much better. What do most Thank people you. tend to do recordings through? You know, other than like Rich Roll who flies, who gets you out there. Yeah. Uh, typically just direct actually. They just oh. call my, a lot of times they just call my, call my line. So. Oh really? Like a phone yeah. call? Like a phone call. Huh. <laughs> do you remember what one of those is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I just called you a one. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's just strange to me. I don't know, especially if it's a landline. Is it a landline they call you on or your cell? No, I use my cell. Hmm. And uh, a lot of times if it's just a video, if it's just a uh, audio, I just use audio because when I turn on the video, the sound quality, they say the sound quality is not mm -hmm. as, as crisp. I'm so. going to turn mine off on that note. <laughs> okay. Um, you might have better, better Wi-Fi than we do. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, who knows? You are in the you middle sound, of the you mountain. You sound good to me. Yeah. Well, I had to get a, <laughs> uh, a real professional setup with the second podcast I've launched. Uh, it's highly produced. So uh, I, my producer bought this really fancy mic, which is apparently the mic that Rich Roll uses. So uh, I guess, you know, he, he invests a lot into his business, into his podcast. So I guess this is a good one. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this is a hopefully a good setup, but yeah. Um, well, I apologize if that was stressing you out. I uh, did not mean to do that. And um, yeah. this works. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on allowing nothing to stress me out these days. So that's a good, that's a good goal. That, that's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I'm trying to do that too. I don't know if we ever get there truly. Um, I was actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I was thinking yesterday, so I've been, I do like meditation. I do this meditation app. And um, the woman, the woman teaching the course that I'm doing right now, she was like talking about um, not harming other humans. And then she said, you know, and, uh, you know, you've got to get to the point to where a mosquito can land on your body and you can feel its tiny feet walking around you and you just let it do its thing and then and then fly away. And I was like, oh, I am a <laughs> hell of a long way before I do not like smush a mosquito that's literally biting me. So I was like, wow, that really shows me how far I've got to go because that is unimaginable for me. Just allowing, watching a mosquito just stick its, whatever it sticks in and just it's draining my blood. It's called a proboscis. <laughs> is it? Are you recording this? This is good stuff. <laughs> well, I hope yeah, you're recording I this. <laughs> I, I mean, I wasn't going to include this, but sure, we can include this. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I guess, you know, getting, getting malaria is, is, uh, is, you know, it's, it's worth not stressing, right? Yeah, <laughs> I can't well, imagine a mosquito. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think I, I just can't ever see a world where I will not get stressed when a mosquito lands on my skin. So, um, are, are you there that then if you, uh, if you're working on not being stressed by anything, do you think you could handle that? Like I'm not talking no, in a race. So. If you were I, sitting it, on a, on a lawn chair and you're in, you know, in your backyard or somewhere, you think you could handle a mosquito? I don't think the question is, could I handle it? You know, would I want to handle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, is, what is the incentive for allowing a mosquito to, you know, to, to insert its, you know, proboscis in you and, and it's saliva. I, I don't know. Like I, at a point, like it's, I would just squ squash the thing. I'm sure any, any rational person would do the same. Well, that's what this woman was saying that that's a human, that's a life, not human, that's a life. So we need to let it be. So that's what I'm saying. I'm a long way off being a wise person. So I thought maybe you'd be further along with, than me, but apparently I've got even further to go if, if you would still struggle with it. And I'd imagine I'll, I'm going to challenge uh, if I do put this in here, anyone listening, can, does anyone think they could allow a mosquito to 
just jump around their body and you know take little samples of them and then just be be okay with it watch it watch it do it i i would be surprised i i could yeah i could deal with a bee mm. i don't i wouldn't you know i that's fine with me a bee can walk on me if it stings me it stings me mm-hmm. it's fine uh, but it's there's just something repulsive about a mosquito just because i i've been in so many places where yeah. i've seen how destructive Mm-hmm. They are to human lives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would just be counterintuitive not to slap it dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I definitely am in the same way. Well, uh, Dean Karnazes, <laughs> welcome back to the Running For Real podcast. Um, yeah, this was not the start I intended, but, you know, we're friends. So I feel like we can we can forgo some of the formalities, especially as you are a third time returning guest. So welcome back. Well, it's rarefied air, I guess, three times. Yeah, I know. You're... I, I didn't realize how many how many other guests have you had on three times. You're in a very set group. I'd say maybe five to ten, not many. Okay. So yeah, you're in a small group, but um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I as I always do when I get books that um, I don't want to say when I get books because I'm sure, like you, I'm sure you're the same. I get offered a ton of books, running books. And so I don't, I don't say yes to that many, but when I do get them, I love to, uh, like they call it earmark the pages, right? Where you fold the corner over. That's the term, right? I think, uh, anyway. I think I've heard a dog, dog, dog ear, it. dog ear. That's I've heard it. dog ear, earmark. Dog. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's dog ear. I think you're right. Um, the corners, I make loads of notes. So I've got lots of questions to ask you, but they're all beyond what your, your new book, a runner's high, my life in motion is, um, about, the first thing I want to ask you about, um, one line that I un- underlined was that you've never been much of a competitive runner. And I'll go on to that in a second. But you said there that you were a comp- or somewhere else, you said you were a competitive surfer, which I had absolutely no idea about. So can you tell us a bit about where that came into the equation? Well, I grew up on the beach in Southern California, mm-hmm. and it was kind of what you did. <laughs> you yeah. surfed. And it was, you know, surfing is a big sport here in California. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, our high school, we had a surfing team. Oh, wow. And we were number one in the state. So we competed against other high schools. Mm-hmm. And I guess I said, uh, you know, that I was a competitive surfer because I entered competition. Um, mm-hmm. Surfing to me is very much like running in that uh, it's somewhat of an art form. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you can surf without being in competition. You can run without being in a race. So they're very similar in that regard. But I guess I wanted just to bring out the distinction that um, not only did I surf, I, you know, I I competed on a team. Oh, that's so cool. That's such a, like, I feel like that's something that I would always dream of adding to my list of things. It's like, I was a competitive surfer. Like that just sounds, I mean, you're in (laughs) California, so maybe not. So it doesn't sound so glamorous because there's a lot of people that do it. But um, to me, that just sounds awesome. Uh, And especially as I have done surfing in the past and, I've said many times that like standing up on a surfboard is the only thing in my life that I've experienced that gave as good of a high as like, you know, accomplishing a race that you've really worked hard towards. That's the only thing I've experienced that's come close. So it's funny you say that because I, I, I very much agree with you mm. that riding a wave is, is a rush and it gives you a mm. runner's high, if you will, Yeah, for sure. <laughs> in, yeah. in a sense. And I'm glad you've experienced that because, um, not everyone has. Mm -hmm. And I'll say the same with, um, with snow. I'm a snowboarder as well. And on certain days in snowboarding, when there's, you know, fresh powder, quote unquote, you know, sliding down a slope gives you that same sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. I've actually had a conversation recently with, with friends about, um, uh, the fact that I've never skied and I've never snowboarded because I was so scared with my running that I was going to straight, uh, you know, roll my knee or my ankle or something. Um, and now being like into my thirties, I'm like, wow, that's kind of surprising that I've never been surf, uh, been skiing and snowboarding. And I've always wondered like, okay, well, if I can surf, does that mean that it will translate? So you've now given me yet another nudge to figure out a way to go skiing and snowboarding because I feel like I've got to give it a try now. <laughs> it, it's, it's like surfing. It's a rush and mm. I think you should try it. Okay. Yeah. I'll work on it. So people listening, keep me accountable. Okay. So in that, what we were just saying there, you said about, um, you know, you can, uh, I can't remember the exact phrase you use, but you can, um, 
you can run without racing. You can, um, you know, do running without the competition aspect of things. And one thing that I found interesting was that you um, said that you have that you said that you've never been much of a competitive runner in the sense of that like for you racing wasn't about like you know looking behind you to see the guy if the guy behind you or the woman behind you is catching you and and like sprinting ahead just to stay ahead now i think for a lot of people that's hard to untangle and even myself to imagine how if you didn't enjoy the competitive aspect of things why would you go in a race wouldn't you just you know, do the runs yourself. So explain to us how that works for you with that. You can love competitions, but not feel the need to compete with other people running. If I, if I understood that correctly. Yeah, I I guess I'm able to uncouple the two. And I think the you know, the biggest competition, Tina is, is myself. I think when I stand at the finish line, if I feel like I perform to the best of my ability, then I'm pleased with my performance. And, you know, you can't control other people. Uh, you can't control the environment. All you can control is, is yourself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the, I've always just thought the competition doesn't matter. You know, you, you need to just do your best. You perform your best, put on the blinders. And, you know, if you do your best, you'll, you'll end up somewhere. Um, if you're on top of the podium, that's, that's brilliant. If not, you know, can, can you cross that finish line and say, I'm, I'm really pleased with my performance. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the, the yardstick I've used to, you know, a, as a gauge for racing. Yeah. I love that. And you gave an example of, um, a, an, a runner in an ultra yelling about how far back the next woman was. Um, and I know I have done that many times with men who have come alongside me or I've caught up to men and been like, tell me how far behind the the next woman is, or like, where is she? And and now I look back at that, I kind of feel sadness towards that previous version of me, like how it was more about that fear of failure, about just staying enough ahead to be in whatever position I was in. Uh, And now running feels like so much more meaningful than that, um, that I want the women behind me to do their best. And if they pass me, then that's amazing. Now I have not raced in the last few years, so I cannot say if I a hundred percent will be able to do this in a race, but, um, tell us what you mean by that approach. You said that that approach seemed to almost defeat the reason for doing an, an ultra. Can you explain a bit more about why, why you feel that is? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, there's a saying, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't hate losing, you will never win. Mm. And I don't know if I just made that up myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a great quote and I, I looked it up and I couldn't find the origins of the quote. So maybe it's just, it's my quote, but I think it's true. I think that the person you're referring to is, is a, is a legend, a yeah. goddess in running. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she was, unbeatable essentially. And I realized she probably was unbeatable because she just hated losing. I mean, she defined herself as a champion who's going to win every race she's in. And she pretty much did. Mm -hmm. And it was a very much different mentality than I had. I mean, to me, running a hundred miles through the mountains was so much about adventure and exploration and, and learning. It was never about competitive racing and it's just my attitude. And, you know, and when I came upon her during the Western States 100 mile endurance run that you're referring to, um, I, I was kind of taken aback by her attitude because I'd ne- I never had really interacted with her. I never knew, you know, what her composition was about. And I just realized she was a uh, just a gritty competitor. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's no respect lost. I, mm-hmm. I don't mean mm-hmm. it as a put down saying, you know, all she wanted to do was win but that was what she wanted to do. And, and, and she did. And then when she stopped winning, (laughs) you know, no one can win forever. Uh, she kind of went away and, um, thankfully, uh, she's reemerged, you know, uh, later on when no one's expecting her to win because she's older now. Mm. And it's, I think it's been a beautiful thing. I mean, I, we're, we're good friends and, you know, I hope she's not offended by what I wrote in the book. But her personality is such that she just was unstoppable. And I I know why, because she was so driven competitively not to lose. Mm -hmm. I I think you're you're right there. And there are some people who view things that way or maybe, yeah, it does change over time. For me, I 
uh, and yeah, same, same, same as you said, like, it's not, I, I don't have any um, loss of respect for that approach. But for me, when I look back on the way I felt, it was really, I just feel like, I wish I could have told myself, um, you know, it's okay if you come second. <laughs> it's okay if you, um, I don't know, I just feel like looking at myself, I had so much like, just not feeling enough, feeling I had to prove myself. And we're going to talk about that with, with some of the things you've talked about, um, in a minute, but, uh, yeah, there's definitely some approaches and some people, I mean, I really respect the fact, like you said, that she walked away when she was, you know, when things were starting to slow down. I mean, that's really amazing that she had the ability to just say, I'm going to walk away now. And even if she did come back like it, that, you know, leaving on a high is, is something that takes a lot of courage in itself. So, um, yeah, thank you for your answer there. Um, a lot of the, the book, uh, a runner's high is about you going through this transition over the last few years of this. You talked a lot about the fear of losing relevance in this sport that had become your life. So when you say that, what did, what does that mean to you? What did that voice say to you? Um, in your head about you not being relevant anymore? You know, it, it says to me, you know, do you, do you stay on the same course you've been on or is it time to, you know, reshape who you are and get a, you know, get a real job, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, you know, to me, I'm a runner at heart and I've worked my whole life to be a runner. And being a runner means, you know, having the time to train and to run and to do those things. So if you have, you know, quote unquote, a full time job, you can't do those things. You can't dedicate yourself wholeheartedly to who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's let's face it, you know, I'm, I'm not a young man. I'm you know, we're talking about competitiveness. I'm, I'm not. A, I mean, I'm winning maybe my age group, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the only people who care about, you know, who's winning your age group are people in your age group. <laughs> and so. To me, you know, can, can I maintain this career? Can I keep doing what I'm doing even as, you know, I'm, I'm well past my prime? And it's funny, there's, there's a, there's a, like a, a measurement, I guess a yardstick, it's called a uh, hook it. And it's similar to in, like in, in, you know, in evaluating a, a, you know, the value of an athlete, there's something called a Q score that you can look at, you know, like LeBron James is just off the charts. You know, his, his value is unbelievable. And for endurance athletes, there's something called a, a hook it. And when I look on hook it, you know, it, it lists basically the most relevant people in running. And, you know, I'm in the top 10 and I look at everyone on the list. You know, I look through the top 50 and, you know, I'm, I don't want to say it, but I'm, I'm 20 years older <laughs> than the next person on that list. And, to me, that uh, there's something to be said about that. Like, how, how have I been able to do that? Um, I, I don't know. It wasn't by intention. It's just it's it's happened. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even though I'm not, you know, the other people on, on that list are winning races and they're unbelievable. You know, they're, they're the household names and running in running circles where, you know, I'm more of a household name in in maybe non running circles as that guy who runs crazy distances. Mm -hmm. And. Why, what is your suspicion as to why that is? I think because I've, what we've been discussing is that I've been true to running, mm -hmm. you know, that I've, I've lived as a runner. I'm passionate about it. I share my passion with others. Um, you know, I, I think people, you know, they respect a guy that can just hang in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, I, everyone loves someone who can hang in there, you know, even, uh, as you know, as they get older, they just keep doing the thing they love. And, you know, to me at some point, I'm, you know, I'm going to transition into that, you know, that old guy that just keeps running that, you know, is <laughs> running his thousands marathon, you know, mm -hmm. and he's, you, you kind of slap him on the back as you pat him and, you know, keep going Dean. And <laughs> but he's there, you know, there's, there's something about just showing up and being there and doing the races and, and loving it. Yeah. And you said in the book that you couldn't, you tried to think of yourself as an ex runner and you couldn't form a vision of, of that man. Um, so I don't know if you remember, but when we ran together last time in 2019, I, I, I kind of asked you about that and you, um, 
I said, you know, I think I said to you something along the lines of like, have you ever thought of what you would do, you know, once or if this, you know, you couldn't do the running stuff anymore. And, you know, you, it was clear to you that, um, or clear to me that, you know, you couldn't even envision a world without that, that it was always, always going to be there. So, um, you know, over the last few years, uh, not to say that running isn't going to be a part of your life, as you just said, you're clearly going to be that, that person who's always there, but like over the last few years, have you gone through this, um, period of thinking like, okay, what does my future look like if I can still be out there? Um, but maybe particularly with what 2020 brought with the, the conversations about inclusivity and, um, just bringing in more people, um, have you been struggling with that at all of like, what if I have to, um, you know, the, the events stop coming in as quick as, as, as often as they were, or even through 2020, they just weren't there. Um, tell us about, yeah. What have you been going through in terms of that? Well, it's, it's been, I'll be honest, I'll be frank. It's been really harsh, mm -hmm. uh, this past year. It's been without, I doubt unequivocally it's been the roughest year I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And it's for the reasons you just said, I mean, I, I never really thought so much about my future because I knew I could go to a race and do a book signing or do a sponsor appearance or a poster signing. And I knew there'd be a couple hundred people there. I was very blessed in that regard that, you know, people wanted to meet with me and, and hang out and whatever, have me sign a book or have me sign a poster or take a, take a photo and that just, as you know, went away. <laughs> it just, mm -hmm. it, with COVID, it just stopped. And when we do not gather, uh, I don't know when that's going to come back online, Tina. Like, I can't imagine, you know, 200,000 people going to the Javits Center uh, at the New York City Marathon to pick up the race bib yep. anytime soon. Yep. That's just not going to happen. So uh, I've had to reevaluate, like, what do you do now? <laughs> And, you know, what is the answer? And there, have, there hasn't been any easy answers. Um, you know, I've, I've always been very, very committed <clears throat> to supporting others through running. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, uh, I've served on the board of um, Girls on the Run, mm -hmm. which is a great national organization that supports, um, you know, young inner city uh, youth girls through running. And it's, you know, it's something that um, it brings me a lot of uh, internal satisfaction. And I've all, also, you know, tried diligently to, um, and, and, you know, increase the visibility of ultra marathoning of ultra running, because one of my you know personal charters is if you can grow this sport, it's going to allow more people to make a living doing what they love, especially a younger generation of runners. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when, when I was coming up through the ranks, you know, there, there was really no possibility of making a, a quote unquote, a living just running. But I think now, you know, if you're at, if you're competing, competitive and, you know, it's become a much more competitive sport. There are people that are making a, a good living, uh, doing what they love, yeah. um, you know, through running. So that's always been, um, something important to me. And I think that, you know, through writing books, it's brought more visibility through interviews with more mainstream press. Uh, it's brought more visibility and participants into the race. And, you know, I, I know you're not heavily into ultra marathoning, but, Ultra marathoning to me is 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 a beautiful sport because it's it's a it's a it's like almost like a an entire life lived during a single race. Mm -hmm. You know, you experience all of those emotions, you know, in the course of 24 hours of running. And it to me it's very it's it's very cleansing for the soul mm -hmm. and people are drawn to it. So, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a a long-winded answer to, you know, where do I go from here? Um, you can tell I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's part of what I sit in bed at night and think about, like, wh what do you do at this point? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've come back to is just be in the moment. You know, you, you can't control what's going on right now as, as you know, you've, you've fought it for a year. Like you've laid in bed and fought this thing and said, you're going to get back into, you know, racing. It's all going to come back online. Everything's going to be fine. Whether that's the case or not, we don't really know. So Right now, it's just take every day, one step at a time, every moment, you know, do the interview with Tina today, um, have a good time with her, you know, move on. Your book is written. Um, so, you, you know, it's going to launch pretty soon. Uh, do the best with your book and just see where it goes. So it's more of a, a 
okay, I, I, I surrender. Like almost, I guess, what you would have to do in a race, right? I, I surrender to whatever's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it happen. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to find a way through. So even that in itself must, must relate to some of the things you experience in an ultra, I'd imagine. Yeah, no, that, that and that's incredibly perspective, you know, uh, uh, perceptive of you, and it's something I never thought through. But you're exactly right. I've I've kind of surrendered because I can't keep fighting, you know, the circumstances because it'll kill you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> uh, literally and figuratively. So I've kind of just surrendered to it and said, you know, do the best you can and and keep moving forward and you know, wake up every day and be thankful. And that's kind of where I've gone to. And that, you know, this is, this is coming from a guy, you know, my background, I mean, I have a business degree. I'm very, I'm very strategic. I mean, I came, I came from nothing. I mean, you know, my parents were great people, but I mean, my dad was a, a field naturalist and my mom was a public school teacher. So I kind of built the life I have and it's just been with intention mm -hmm. and, you know, setting goals and milestones and objectives. And that just collapsed with mm -hmm. COVID. So mm -hmm. It's been a, it's been a real interesting experience. And honestly, this is going to sound really funny to you, but running has saved me. I mean, I, you know, I tell people all the time, if you're depressed, uh, you know, if you're having problems, you know, motion stirs emotion. I mean, emotion follows motion. And I've had to like force myself to go running. And that never was the case prior to COVID. I mean, I always look forward to going running and you know where I, where I run. I mean, you've been here, mm -hmm. you see how beautiful it is. Mm -hmm there are days where I'm, I'm just forcing myself to get out the door and run because I know when I come back, I'm going to feel better. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of used my own medicine to, to help <laughs> cure me, but running has, has been more essential to me than ever. And it's, it's more for my head than my body at this point. So is it the, the thoughts are saying, well, what's the point? There's no races. I'm not going to see anyone. What are some of the things that you have to just because I, I had imagine a lot of things that you would share are, are things other people will go through or have been through the last year. And hearing you say it will be like, wow, if, if, if Dean's experiencing this, then, you know, I must be okay too. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I had a lot of messages from people saying I've lost my motivation. What do I do? And I think it is cathartic, cathartic for them to, for me to say, I, <laughs> I have too. It is so funny when I was, when I was so busy before and traveling so much, you know, I, I look forward to running as a form of escapism. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, you know, it was soul, you know, it was cleansing. You, you know what it feels like mm -hmm. now that I can go running at any time I want it. It's kind of reversed, <laughs> reversed in a way that those sort of, um, you know, emotions, I mean, feeling guilty that you're going running because you should be doing something to try to, you know, pay the bills is a horrible feeling. So I've, to your point, I've kind of surrendered and just said, you need to go running because it's going to help you, mm -hmm. uh, with everything else in your life. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. Do you want to run further and faster and recover quicker and easier? Do you need to feel healthier than you've ever felt before? You need to make a change. And that is what Inside Tracker is all about. Founded by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometric data from MIT, Tufts, and Harvard, InsideTracker is a personalized health and wellness platform like no other. So what is their secret? Well, first, InsideTracker uses its patented algorithm to analyze your body's data and offer you a clearer picture than you've ever had before of what's going on inside you. Then, InsideTracker provides you with concrete, science-backed, trackable action plan for reaching your performance goals and being your healthy best. You want to hear the great part? Inside Tracker is offering my listeners 25% off. Yes, 25% off discount to their entire store. All of the options you can look at there. You can go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina because change is an inside job. Now that I can go running at any time I want, it, it's kind of reversed, <laughs> reversed in a way that those sort of, um, you know, emotions, I mean, feeling guilty that you're going running because you should be doing something to try to, you know, pay the bills is a horrible feeling. So I've, to your point, I've kind of surrendered and just said, you need to go running because it's going to help you, mm -hmm. uh, with everything else in your life. 
Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I appreciate you your honesty with us. And um, just before we, I want to tell you something that you're going to like in a minute. But I think I'm just going to go down this uh, this hole a little bit further. Um, so I mentioned about the inclusivity aspect. Uh, have you also been working through that um, as a white male? I mean, um, the the white men that I'm closest to in my life have all been going through this time of thinking like, wow, things are changing. And even though, you know, uh, they can be good people and accepting and understanding that this happened, this needs to change. You know, I they look back on their own lives and think, wow, yeah, there was a lot of events and things I did where it was just all white people at these events. But still, that's hard to let go of the idea of of wow, that means that, you know, I might not be called upon as much or I may not have opportunities as much, which I'm happy for other people, but it's still tough to deal with. Have you been working through any of that? Yeah, I mean, I have in a lot of ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of stigma attached with being a, a white man. And yeah, I, I don't, I, for some reason, I think of myself as, as ethnic, as being Greek. Yes, because they yeah. come from such an ethnic family. Like, I, don't, yeah. I don't like I look at white men. I'm like, oh, that, I'm, I'm not the <laughs> typical white man. But I mm-hmm. I get your point. And mm-hmm. it's, it's something really struck me. And this was, you know, in 2019 when you were out with your husband and he was interviewing for coaching jobs. And you telling me, like, you know, he, he's he's a white man. He's it's he, people are not looking to hire white men for those sort of management roles at this point. And I thought, you know, that's really unfortunate because your husband to me seemed like such a great guy. I mean, he seemed so, you know, just so (laughs) harmless, if you will, Mm -hmm. that he would just be overlooked because of the color of his skin. That's almost like, in a sense, it's it's reverse discrimination. So I think, you know, it it has in a way um, led a lot of people to feel disenfranchised because they're white, you know, middle class or upper class males. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my in my heart, I'm such an inclusive person that it really hurts me sometimes when, you know, people might look at me and think, well, you know, he's he, here's another just white guy that thinks like, a, you know, whatever white guy thinks like. But it's it's been a, it's been an interesting um, time frame to live through and to reckon with. And, mm-hmm. you know, to your point. A lot of the races that we go to, you know, it's it's primarily, um, you know, highly educated, highly affluent white people. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Have you ever done or been to a Spartan race, like an obstacle course race? No. You, you you would not believe the variety of people that show up there. I mean, yes, there's a lot of, you know, hella fit, ripped people <laughs> that, you know, are, are amazing athletes. But then there are other people that, you know, there are, there are like our extended ethnic families that come to these events. And they, ha- I mean, the, the, the kids come, the grandparents come, the parents come, everyone comes. And the first time I went to a Spartan race, I'm like, hold it. This is a really interesting dynamic. Like this, this feels more like how I was brought up in this ethnic sort of setting. And so I've really become a strong advocate for Spartan racing because until you go and you see this dynamic, you would never expect it. I don't know what it is that uh, draws this sort of crowd to a Spartan race, but it's it's a much different experience than going to like a, a regular marathon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, well, a few things. Firstly, um, thank you for the kind words you said about about Steve. Um, I mean, we have done a lot of reading and learning and and kind of, um, you know, uh, reckoning with with the changes that are happening. And we're trying to um, he's he's definitely understanding as to why this was why this is the case that, you know, out of the one let's just round number it, 1000 coaches that are uh, working in college, there should never have been eight or nine hundred of them as white men. So. Um, you know, yes, things are changing, but they, they needed to. So we're trying to keep that in mind, but yeah, it is tough mentally to, to know that someone is, um, maybe going to have a bit of a tough time, um, and have to just be okay with that. But then to your point of, of Spartan races, how, so what is it that's different there? Like how, how does, how do the Spartan races manage to be diverse, but not the rest of the running world? 
it, maybe it has something to do with inclusion mm. or our messaging. I, I, I like I, I question every time I go to a race, I come back and I just, you know, talk to my wife and just say, you, you can't believe, you know, there there are people of every skin color of, of every age, of every ability doing these races. It's, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful thing. I don't, I don't know why it's become what it has. And until you've been there and really paid attention, you know, you don't see this dynamic, but to me, it was very apparent from the first time I did a Spartan race, like this is a different crowd like this. Yeah. And you know, they're, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite amazing. And it's, it's really beautiful to me. I feel much more at home mm. in that crowd. It just seems like a warmer feeling to me for some reason. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know how it's, you know, to, to answer your question, I don't know how it's evolved into what it has, but you know, it, it's to me, it, it, I would love to see every race, every run that with that same sort of, um, uh, you know, mix of individuals. Yeah. I love that. Mix of individuals. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can all take some lessons from the Spartan races. Um, and, uh, we can talk more about that potentially, um, at another time or even later on. Okay. So, well, firstly, you said about trying to figure out about your future. And I wanted to say to you that I did tell you, you said earlier uh, you, that I'm not that into ultra running, but Dean, uh, when this comes out, I think I will be uh, two weeks away from my first trail marathon. So that's that. That's trail marathon. That's going to be the first time I've done that. And then I've told you that I'm looking to um, the, the, the full um, time to do my first, do an ultra or 50 K or 55 K potentially, or something like that. So one job you can have is you can be my mentor because I mean, can't get much better than that for you to give me advice. So there you go. I've solved your future for you. You can be my 24 seven when I'm panicking in the middle of the night, you, I can just call you and be like, Dean, what do I do now? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you're you remember you're on the record. You're you provided yeah, a really nice quote for my book, and you said I want to do the Western States one day. I know. And when you when you when that's in writing, I mean, that's got to happen, Tina. <laughs> so yeah, call me, <laughs> call me anytime. Yeah. yeah, you seem quite surprised by that. I, I just didn't know it was anything you were thinking of, and mm. um, yeah, no, it, it did surprise me, and <laughs> I was really happy to see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, really happy to see it. Yeah, well, we'll see when when that is the case um, someday. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's let's just go down that path for path for a little bit. For su- say say there was someone who was venturing into the trail world, you know, no one specific, um, <laughs> who was coming into this for the first time. And actually, I say this, I'm not alone here. And act- you mentioned about one of your, uh, one of the things you've always tried to do is to get more people into ultra running. And it does seem that 2020 has a lot of people have turned to trail running. Um, and the, from what I see over the last five or so years, the numbers for trail and ultra races and mountain races has continued to increase. So, um, what would be some things say there was someone you knew who was about to do their first trail marathon or trail race. What would you say to that? What would you say is some of the the main things to keep in mind in a race setting? Yeah, it, it you know, and tra- when we, we talk about trails, I mean, it can mean so many things, you know, it can be a, a graded fire road, like the rails to trails conversion in your area, or it can be like a rugged single track, you know, through, through the, the forest or the mountains, like you saw when you came and ran with me. And so you made fun of my me. My thought, <laughs> I told I, you to slow down. <laughs> no, no, you told me how bad I was at downhills. I have not let that go. That like is etched in by memory. How uh, you commented on how bad I was at downhills because well, the, you must have seen a lot exactly, of downhill that runners. Was the, <laughs> Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of really talented downhill runners. And I think that's, that'd be one of my bits of advice is to train on the the type of terrain you're going to, you're going to be racing on mm. because, you know, if it's rooted and rocky and very technical, you know, wa- watching your footfalls is really important. And also, you know, you're going to, you're going to gain more time on the downhills than on the uphills. I mean, the uphills, a lot of people power walk mm-hmm. and the, those that are running are not that m- much further ahead but if you look at a good downhill runner, they pick up a lot of, of, you know, spare time in the downhills. So, you know, learn to run the downhills, learn to run, um, and the type of terrain you're going to be racing in, because 
again, you know, trails, it's not like saying a road race where you can just say, yeah, there's, you know, there's a, there's a couple big hills and, you know, there's heartbreak Hill Mm -hmm. at mile 20 or 22, whatever heartbreak Hill is at, you know, a trail race, um, is it's, it can be a, a flat trail. It can be a wide trail. It can be a narrow trail. It can be rooted in Rocky. It can be bushwhacking. So it's, it's much, it's much broader, but I would encourage people to, you know, to look at the race they've chosen. And mm-hmm. if you can get on that actual course, that's even better, but train for the terrain you'll be, you'll be racing in. That's great. Thank you. What about, uh, you mentioned, we said just there about getting more people into ultra running. There must be that part of you that feels a little bit torn with that, right? Because, um, trail running probably and getting out on the trails was probably always something that was kind of quiet and something exclusive and something that the trails weren't overused because there weren't as many people going over them. Um, is that tough to want to encourage more people to join, but also at the same time, you're losing some of the specialness about it because it is the numbers, uh, are increasing. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say that because when my book, my first book came out, which was back in 2005, um, a lot of, a lot of people said, you know, you, you've, you've ruined it. You've given away the Holy grail of running, you know, <laughs> ultra marathoning. And I thought, wow, you know, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to live with that, that I did expose more people to ultra running. And if you want to fault me for that, that's fine. Uh, I get it. Um, you know, I'm, we talked about surfing and one thing that's just sacred in surfing is if you find a good surf spot, you keep it secret <laughs> mm. because it's, it's kind of a zero sum game when it comes to surfing. There's only so many waves. So if there are a lot of people competing for that one wave, it's not that much fun where to me, uh, you know, trail running and ultra marathon is not a zero sum game. There are a lot of trails. Yeah. A lot of the trail, the more popular trails are more crowded but there's a lot of room to explore new trails. I guess the, the biggest downside is, you know, something like Western States that you want to, you want to race in, you know, getting into mm. Western States because it's on the lottery system. And I wrote about this in the book because yeah. the number of entries are limited. It is, it is, you know, it's, it's hard to get in to run Western States. There's a lot more people that want to run it than can run it. So that's, that's one kind of downside, but there are certainly a lot of other hundred mile alternatives. Mm -hmm. I really respected the fact that you've talked, well, not even just talked in the book, but had the approach, or I guess that Western States, I didn't know. Um, So there's the, the, what do they call them? Golden ticket spots. Is that the the term? Yeah. Yeah, So that's the spots like you know, you get a guaranteed entry, but then, um, to everyone else, it's the lottery system. And I really appreciated that you were in that lottery system because I do think, and this is a privilege that you and I both have, that there are many circumstances where we can kind of get a spot. Maybe someone else couldn't. And I really uh, admire that Western States, you know, makes it fair for everyone in that you, um, were not just automatically accepted to be, you know, a name that came in, but you had to to wait and see if you made it in and being on the wait list and then moving your way up slowly. Um, and it just happening to be chance that you got in. I really just thought that was pretty impressive that they have, you know, stuck to their guns on that, even though that, it, you know, you and I definitely are very lucky to be able to kind of get in races like that sometimes um it you don't see that very often or at least i don't yeah no and i've stuck to my guns on that point as well like i do not accept like you know a <clears throat> a celebrity entry or anything like that mm-hmm. i i will not it's not fair mm-hmm. i mean one of the things i love about running is very democratic right it, mm-hmm. the playing field's even so, you know, I've, I've been given, you know, these quote unquote celebrity entries to certain races and I, I don't use it. Um, if, if there is no lottery and there's a qualifying time, like I, I received a, a celebrity entry into Ironman, uh, Kona, mm-hmm. which is, you know, I, I've always wanted to, to race at Ironman Kona, but it was a year I never did a qualify, you know, there's qualifiers for Ironman Kona. I never did a qualifier. So if I didn't qualify, I'm, I'm not going to, it'd be like running Boston without qualifying to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's, it's not right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm never going to ask for any special, um, you know, privilege of, above and beyond another runner because I'm just like everyone else, just another runner. 
Thank you to Beam for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I am loving using this product. I was excited to tell you about it a few weeks ago, and now I'm a few weeks out from my trail marathon, and I'm even more, enjoy- I shouldn't say I'm even more enjoying it. I was enjoying it from the start. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, their crazy scientist flavor guy has somehow managed to do the impossible, which is to get me to like a citrus flavored drink and a watermelon flavored drink. They're both great. I drink them in my bottles. Uh, I have the watermelon flavor in my um, bottles for that I'm going to be using in my trail race. And the they are just really enjoyable. They also have these super hydrating ingredients like coconut water and Himalayan sea salt. So whether you're looking for everyday balance, um, performance or recovery, the powders are going to be there to give your body the hydration it craves. As I mentioned um, previously, 75% of Americans are chronically dehydrated. Um, I (laughs) will put my hand up and say I'm absolutely one of them. And I'm excited to be able to have this variety pack. You can check it out um, by going to beamtlc.com. Um, It'll give you the experience of the benefits of all three of their electrolyte powders. So they have the Balance One, which is a potent blend of prebiotics and probiotics to support healthy digestion and immune function. Their Performance One, which is the one I have in my bottle for, for what I will be using to race, has a green coffee bean extract to deliver an energizing boost with compounds like beetroot and vitamin B to help your body convert dietary and energy into physical energy. And finally, last but not least, the recovery restores collagen while branch chain amino acids support tired muscles and help your body fight fatigue. They put thought into their products. They are um, sourced responsibly and I um, uh, will be excited to share even more information with you about what Beam are up to um, when it comes to their environmental footprint they are making in the next few months. I'm excited to be working with this product. I'm excited to be using this product. It's made a big difference in my life and I think think it will be for you too. You can go to beamtlc.com, use code TINA for 20% off a subscription or 15% off your order if you want to do a one-off. Go to beamtlc.com and use code TINA. So if I didn't qualify, I'm I'm not going to, it'd be like running Boston without qualifying. To me, Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, it's, it's not right. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm never going to ask for any special, um, you know, privilege above and beyond another runner, because I'm just like everyone else, just another runner. I appreciate that. And obviously you're a better man than I have, um, because I definitely have asked a few (laughs) times if I could be let in races, but I can also use my, I'm also gone. Yeah. Well, I'm also a little bit more visible in some ways, and I get a lot of I get a lot of shit, and rightly so. If I was accepting these, you know, these entries where other people had to struggle so hard to get an entry. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, and I was going to say, I I think I I did that more when I had the the um, elite card I could pull that um, you know I could challenge for the win, or I could you know things like that. So um, hopefully, people don't think I'm a horrible person now. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I, I don't think you are, Gina. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. At least I know one person. Right. So let, let's, so um, I guess doing a summary of the book, I don't want to give too much away. I've, I've asked some questions based on it. Um, a runner's high, my life in motion. You talk about your journey up to uh, Western States, is it 2019? 2018. 18. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, doing the race. And I really loved the, the family element that you added in here, um, for people to get to know, um, your family more and just to see the, um, the relationships there and, and really get more of a glimpse into your life, um, in, in a different way. Um, but I don't want to give any more away for people. I want people to go check it out and I'll put a link in the show notes to it, but I want to just, um, as this book showed that you are, coming to the point where, um, you know, this was potentially your last Western States, um, or at least, well, I guess actually you never said that. Um, but, uh, this was, um, you're starting to think about races in terms of like, what does my future hold? What do I look like? What does it look like? What do I want to do next? When you look at all the things you've done, um, the, the traveling you've done, things you've accomplished, uh, is there anything that you see, they all have in common or something that um 
lessons that seem to come out in each of those moments that are most special to you? You know, I think there's this curiosity I have to see, you know, if I can do something <laughs> um, and the surprise when I when I actually pull it off. So, you know, a lot of people when I when they hear what I've done, you know, they they think I'm fearless and I don't I don't necessarily think of myself as fearless because I get maybe we're surrounded by people that are equally fearless. But I think a lot of people it's it's you know, it's not failure that that holds them back. It's the fear of failure. Yeah. So I'm not afraid to fail and I'm not afraid to try new things. And I'm always curious about new challenges. And, and that's kind of what drives me and, and be that challenge, you know, writing a book. I mean, you know, writing a book is every bit as challenging as an ultra marathon, if not more so. Uh, it's just as grueling. It's just, it requires the same sort of commitment and discipline. I mean, you know, these things mm -hmm. and, you know, to me, book writing is something I take very seriously. I mean, I, to me, you know, I, I, I want to serve the reader. Like I want anyone who picks up my books and to walk away and say, that was, that was great. That left me feeling lighter, you know, left me enlivened, motivated, inspired. I want it to be uh, a propulsive story, you know, where someone dives into it and like watching a good movie, you, you know, you, you, you lose your ego for a time and you become absorbed in something else. And you're in that, in, in that other moment that's really magical. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I'm able to capture that in my writing. And that's, you know, that's something I've, I've worked very hard at. Um, it's just curiosity, you know, what else can you do? I mean, can you go further? I, I wrote, you know, there, my first book has been licensed or I should say option into uh, a movie. Mm -hmm. So I actually wrote the script. I mean, I wrote, I've never written a movie script before, but I saw what the, the first writer did and I thought I can do a better job than this. So I, I convinced uh, the, the company, the entity that, that bought these rights and said, let, let me take a, a, you know, a swipe at writing this movie script. And it came out really well. So they're, they're going to use that in mine instead. And that was just, you know, out of curiosity to learn how to do that. So that was a, I'm curious how to be a script writer or just I'm curious of how I can get the best out of my story. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, but, mm -hmm. you know, writing the, the script to my book was, you know, let's, let's try something. You know, it was a curiosity. Like, can I pull this off? Like what, mm -hmm. what does a movie script look like and how is it different than writing a book? And, and so, you know, learning the craft, which wasn't easy, you know, it's, it's very different storytelling writing uh, a movie than it is writing a book. Yeah. I would believe. <laughs> and and what yeah. is the update as of right now? I mean, I think last time I had you on in 2019, it was, you know, you, you had, they, they had, uh, would you say the license? That's what you call it. Taking the license. Yeah. They, yeah basically the option. They, yeah. they, they, they call it an option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is there any updates on that in, in it moving forward or did COVID put every a halt to any more conversations about that? No, it's, it's, is moving forward. I mean, COVID is, has, you know, uh, it's delayed things a bit, but it's still moving forward. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, because of the way the contract's written, I can only say so much, mm -hmm. yep, fair. <laughs> but it's, it is moving forward. And, you know, I will let you know that one, one thing I had written into, into the contract is anyone attached to this film has to be a runner yeah. themselves. Yeah. I remember you saying So that. especially the, yeah, especially like the, the, you know, the main character, uh -huh. And yeah, because, you know, I, I'm a surfer. We talked about, I mean, Hollywood has made so many, you know, <laughs> lame surfing movies that, uh, you know, I did not want this to be a lame running movie because some <laughs> of the running movies out there are really, are really good. I mean, chariots of fire. I mean, think about some of the, some of the running movies out there. They're really good. And I wanted this to be, um, you know, similar. So yeah. Anyone, anyone who's involved, it would be it a cameraman or the director, um, they have to be a runner. Oh, wow. So even down to that level, I knew you said it about the, the characters, but you're saying anyone involved. I, I put in That's anyone. You, so that gives yeah. me discretion, like the catering <laughs> company, you know, whatever. <laughs> you got to be runners. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I think maybe that part might be a little like, uh, yeah, sure. I, I ran from my van to the door. Does that count? Uh, especially as we, I spend a lot of my time trying to tell people that, that you are a runner, even if you, as you know, the, from the second you were out the door, doesn't matter how far. So 
we'll have to be careful with uh, I'm not giving people way out so that they can say, yeah, I went for a, you know, a one block run this morning. So I'm a runner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, since the pandemic, running has experienced a boom of new participants. And when you survey these individuals, they say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not a runner. Like I, yeah, I started running, but I'm not a runner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't think of themselves as a runner, but they're running, you know, a few miles uh, a day or a week because of the pandemic. And so hopefully a lot of these people will get into the sport, um, at, you know, as, as we come out of it. For sure. Yeah, well, I hope so. And actually one of those people, I know she listens to my podcast now, uh, my mum has become a runner and I hope if she's listening to this, she will be able to say I'm a runner too, not just say I, I do some running. Um, I'm so proud of her in case Go that mom. wasn't already. I love, yeah, I'm Go mom. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the first time and I've been running since I was 14. So I'm definitely very proud of her. Uh, and yeah, it's a really cool thing to have. Let's think about just another summary question. What about all your, the best runs that you can think of in the experiences that you have had so far? Do any of them have anything in common? Uh, you mentioned that curiosity, but what about the runs themselves? Was there a certain mindset? Was there expectations? Uh, I mean, what was present in all those best runs that you can think of or best experiences? You know, <laughs> overcoming hardship. So I think that, you know, we remember what is difficult mm -hmm. more than we remember what is easy. So, the, you know, the runs that I reflect on are where things really suck, <laughs> <laughs> where I thought, you know, this is miserable. This is horrible. I, I'm not I don't know if I'm going to make it, you know, where, where you're just that beat up that you're questioning, can I can I do this? And moving beyond that and reaching the finish line is is so fulfilling because it you know, it proved to you that you're, you know, that you're better than you thought you were. Mm -hmm. And relearning that lesson over and over again is, is not a bad thing. So reflecting on the, you know, I, I don't reflect back on the good races, you know, that's kind of magical and everything comes together. I think back and reflect back on the races that have just been really difficult. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And maybe something that people wouldn't initially think of, they would think, oh, that time I had a runner's high and I felt so good and everything was easy. Um, but you're right. As I think back to some of the most meaningful moments, they weren't when I felt the best. It was, yeah, overcoming things and not letting things get to me or things going wrong and, and, and handling it anyway. So uh, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Mentioning that. We don't know what the future holds. We've talked about how you've surrendered to it. Um, and we don't know about what upcoming races there are. Um, but do you have any advice based on what you have learned over the last year that you would like to give any runners listening for just maybe working through the, a, a tough time that they are going through? Maybe they just retired and they're finding it really hard to know you know, who they are, what to do with themselves. Maybe they've lost a job and are feeling that. Maybe their running is, they've got a, a, an injury that um, is going to take them out for a while. For anyone who's going through that, um, kind of figuring out what the next steps are, what would your advice be? You know, to, to just be in the moment, not think too much about anything. Try to, try to live in the present, in the here and now. Um, and also I think, you know, my advice would be, you're not alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, you know, people think, wow, you're, you know, you, you have everything and you're so successful and, you know, you've written books, you know, you've raced across the world, you know, you've won accolades, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, you know, knowing that I am feeling the same feelings you just described, maybe that, that will help someone and knowing they're not alone. I think a lot of times when we feel that it's our problems are unique to us, it, it really, it's very, it's tough. It's mm -hmm. really tough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am, I, I feel the same feelings that other people feel and they're, they're complex feelings. I mean, the guilt and the shame that I feel for feeling bad, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I look at myself and, and think you have everything, you have no right to feel, you know, this 
existential crisis, Mm -hmm. but it's how I feel. I mean, you have no right to question the meaning of life. You have everything. And, and there's guilt with that and shame. And, uh, you know, to, for me to experience these things are, are new and difficult. So for other people that are experiencing and having these same emotions, know that you're not alone. Yeah, that's so it doesn't make it any, it doesn't make it any easier. It's still going to be tough. It's still going to be difficult, but you're not alone. That in itself makes a big difference. Uh, as you know, uh, feeling that other people are in it, other people have been through it, other people will come to it. We all will. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your honesty there. All right, Dean. So a runner's high, my life in motion. Uh, people can go get it for through a link in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to tell people listening or tell them where they can go find you? Yeah, no, I, I hope like if you decide to pick up the book, I hope you enjoy it. I, I really hope it's uh, an immersive read and it, it, you know, you, you finish the book feeling good. And, and you want to go running. And if, if that's the case, then I, you know, then, then I did my job. I, I definitely enjoyed it. Although I will say one night I was reading it. I read each night before I fall asleep, like, um, to go to bed. And the one night I can't remember which, which you were talking about one of the races early on. I think it was, um, uh, it was, oh, it was the hundred miler you did. I don't want to give too much away to prepare for Western States, but you were in a pretty rough spot for a while in part of it. And I feel like, I don't know if it was just that you wrote it so well that I, I could feel what you were feeling or because you are a friend and it like upset me to think of you being in that like state and struggling. But like, I couldn't fall asleep because I was like really like worked up and amped up. So, um, I had to then strategically continue reading or um, stop reading when I sensed you were getting yourself into trouble as I finished the rest of the book uh, to make sure that I didn't <laughs> uh, didn't stay up worrying about you, even though you'd already finished and you were fine. Um, it, so yeah, I would definitely say an immersive read on, on my my end of things. Um, and well, and thoroughly I, mean, I, I mean, one day I'd love to just share, you know, a book of just the the messages I've gotten from people Mm. that have said similar things that you've said. I mean, people have like done amazing things. I mean, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of messages I have where people say, well, I picked up your first book. I started reading it, you know, eight hours later at three in the morning, I finished and I decided I'm going to go running. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's like, Wow, that was incredible, and and when I hear stories like that, I I just think that okay, well that it was worth it was worth all the hard work you put into writing that book because, you know you you've you've touched someone in a way that's um that's uh that that's not easy yeah yeah so what does what does someone like Dean Carnazes do with all those like do you do you have messages like that from people kept somewhere that you can go back to them someday or I mean how how do you sort through that. You know, I, I keep them all yeah. and I try to respond to as many. I mean, I've got a, a folder in my, in my, um, outlook that's probably got, I don't know, 30 or 40,000 messages in it. Wow. I just put them in there and I've got probably six or seven file cabinets down in my garage with, with physical letters people have written me. Wow. And I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe my kids one day will, will read them and feel the same warmth that I felt, but to me, I can't, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm very sentimental mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just, I can't, I can't part with them. I just think it'd be a disservice for me to just to throw them away. Yeah. So I've, I've kept every single one. Yeah. A yeah, lot of them are for a... kids too. The kids like oh. where, you know, I've been at their school and given a talk and, and, you know, they, they write me a letter, a young kid. And to me, that's, I got to keep it. <laughs> yeah. That's so sweet. And I, I, I definitely feel the same way. I'm sentimental in that way as well. Dean, thank you so much for joining me for the third time. I appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship and just all that you um, have done for our community and will continue to. Um, I know that we will work out what your next step is and I can't wait to see what it is. So thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on and thank you for doing what you do. You've inspired a lot of people and, and keep going. Thank you. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mishaps in the episodes, 
while still keeping in the the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation, this is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the ers and the the sometimes the delay in in words because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity. We're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything and I think it's really important that running for real stays that way so thank you to Jeremy for your work I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore who are also part of my team they've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand so just want to give them a shout out too all right let's get right back to the end of this episode I always enjoy Dean's openness and honesty. I feel very special and privileged with um, the way that he shares his struggles with us Um, and the fact that he is going through a difficult time, but he still was able to be open and honest with us about it. Um, And I am quite proud of myself, honestly, for asking some of the questions I did and and saying some of the things I did. It's very much uh, been some things that have been on my mind, um, particularly when we, what we talked about with white males, Um, I know many of you are either a white male or are closely connected to a white male and it is a bit of a strange time to be going through Um, and there is going to be some uncomfortableness with working through what's going on right now. So I appreciate those of you who are putting in the time and energy to try to um, understand and be thoughtful and be prepared to um, for things to change because they do need to. Okay, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this episode. I am excited to introduce you to Beam, who I have mentioned today. Um, I have been using their electrolyte powders in my drink because I'm definitely not the best at getting drinks in otherwise, but this makes a big difference. I'm also using it in my fueling strategy and will be using it in my trail marathon in a few weeks. Um, in one of my bottles, the Perform uh, flavor, which is watermelon. Um, You can get 20% off your order if you get a subscription by using code TINA, or you can get 15% off if you just want to do a one-off purchase to try it out. Uh, You can find out more at beamtlc.com and go use code TINA for 20% off if you get a subscription or 15% off your order if you just want to do a one-off. Also want to thank Momentus for sponsoring this episode. I've been talking a lot about brain drive lately. I have been finding that really helpful for getting me to focus when I'm doing my work. But also um, it is great for taking before your runs, those really important runs where you want to um, stay engaged and stay, stay connected, stay, you know, where you can push yourself. Um, they have been a fantastic asset for that reason Um, and particularly as now the races are starting to look more realistic if you want to get into a point where you are really trying hard and training and giving your best to it you may want to look into brain drive Um, it is a great product to check out you can get 20 percent off your order by going to livemomentous.com and using code tina and finally, I want to thank Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode. Um, you can go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina to get 25% off the entire site. I told you I have been checking out, um, I got my blood work done recently to make sure that everything was on target and I got some things that I could work on and I am working on. So I'm really thankful to Inside Tracker for that. And if you haven't been feeling quite right or you haven't had a check in in a while, that is definitely a good service to be using. All right, my friends, if you didn't already go listen to the Running Realized episode that came out on Monday, be sure to go find that on your favorite podcast player. And if you could leave a review for this and that podcast, you would be making my day. Thank you so much for your shares, for all the things that you do to help grow this podcast. Appreciate you and I will see you next week.